Hello there, welcome to a Dwarven campaign abridged in Total War Warhammer 2. Abridged meaning we'll only be looking at the most important parts. We're also playing a modded campaign. Not only do we have the Steel Faith Overhaul mod, but we're playing as a modded faction, the Greybeard's Prospectors. This is a Dwarven faction that's mainly based around gadgets and guns, and they start far away from the rest of the Dwarves, making them a bit more interesting than the other options. So we're down here in Araby, the Arabia stand-in location. I was immediately looking up here towards the Wood Elf Kingdom, because my initial thought was that I would make a random goal for this campaign, and that it would be something to do with killing the Wood Elves. Here's me checking what you're actually supposed to do. This campaign, like most Warhammer campaigns, has a severe case of heavy expectations on the player, so we're almost certainly not going to do this list of stuff. The main culprit here for making this list kind of unfeasible is this list of places you have to control or be allied to. As you go through them, it quickly becomes clear it's basically everything. These regions are all over the world, so you'd have to conquer most of the map to actually achieve the short victory conditions. Like right there, we want Nagarond and the Black Crag at the top left and bottom right of the map. There is absolutely no mercy. Who knows what the long victory conditions could even add on top of that. So we're probably just going to play until I get bored or until I reach some sort of arbitrary conclusion. I will, by the way, be making some narrative episodes about this campaign and things that I want to happen in the narrative might actually end up influencing what the objective of this campaign ends up being. Not quite sure how it's going to work. We're going to be making it up as we go along. For more on that, subscribe to Game World Narratives in the description if you haven't done so already. Now, for this campaign, what we're going to do is get right into a battle, an extremely easy battle right here. We're fighting some Bretonians who are in our home province, and we start at war with them, and within one turn's movement range with our little army here. This was just a chance to see how the units work. Our faction, as mentioned, is based around guns for the most part, so most of our units are ranged units. We start off with some artillery, and they're having a good time blowing up those poor peasants as they make their way across this desert towards us. We've got this special unit, the Scout Gyrocopter with Heavy Thunderers. The Gyrocopter itself can shoot a machine gun out of the front, but more importantly, the Heavy Thunderers are a unit that comes out of the bottom and can just be dropped onto the field, a free extra unit, essentially. And they're just a gun unit, so they'll stand there and shoot at things in front of them. And they're utterly disposable because they die at the end of the battle anyway, so they're a perfect sacrifice. We're not really doing any strategy for this fight, just walking at them and shooting. Well, that's all we need, really, because there's nothing much to this peasant force. We can just shoot them down. Eventually, they're dead, and that's the end of that. One thing you might have spotted if you're looking very closely is that the balance bar at the start of this battle was roughly even, whereas on the campaign map it was extremely one-sided. That's an issue that's going to come up a few times. It's always an issue in Warhammer. But with this modded campaign, it seems to be worse than normal. We'll talk about that as it comes up. Well, we've now secured our home province. That was particularly easy. We already have another target, though, because the faction that we just attacked has another region directly to the north. So we'll go and attack them just to finish off the war. Wanted to throw up some more units first. We can, for now, only recruit sentries who are not very good and aren't even a gun unit. But in the next turn, I cancelled that recruitment because we finished the building that lets us make our two base generic units, the Legionaries and the Scouts. The Legionaries are our melee unit stand-in. They're also a gun unit, but they're short range, and they have really high armor. So they're good for kind of being in melee, whereas Scouts are more of a normal ranged unit, weak in melee, but with a powerful ranged attack. So with some combination of those two units, we can do a pretty standard build where our short range gun units will be our melee units, and the long-range gun units will do the shooting while the heavily armoured legionaries just kind of get killed and try to hold off the enemy's melee stuff. After recruiting a few more guys, here we are attacking that castle to the north. Need to assign this rune to somebody. Decided to throw this onto the gyrocopter so it's less likely to get shot down. I feel like ranged units are going to be its main weakness. I did wait with the siege to make some siege equipment, but they sallied and the balance bar improved dramatically as a result, so that's all good. Now we're facing them in the field, and again on that balance bar, it looks 
really good right here. This is an auto resolve for all intents and purposes, but I wanted to fight it just to try out some strategies and stuff. And immediately here in the actual battle, the balance bars turned around. Now they have the advantage. I really don't know what makes it so different. I remember it being a problem before, but not this bad. Warhammer does have its issues with auto resolving. Although in this case, it's going to work to our advantage because if the campaign balance bar wants to be better than it's supposed to be, that means we should be able to skip some battles by just auto resolving them in cases where you probably would win even if the in battle balance bar was bad due to tactics. Well, we'll see. In this case, I decided to do the battle and yes, according to the balance bar, I actually should be doing this one, it's not really an auto resolve. As for what's happening in the battle, you can see one guy has decided to come and ravage our lines. He got shot a few times on the way in and this is their commander, so he's half dead. Now he's just kind of stuck there, probably not going to do all that much. We are going to be facing against Bretonia lots of these peasant archers and they're absolutely spamming us with arrows. They outrange the guns on our frontline units and the backline ones are slightly too far away to shoot the peasants. Luckily, with over 100 armor, our guys are pretty good at being shot by arrows, it's not going to do much damage. The fact we're on top of a hill is making our artillery not very useful, we actually can't see very much from where the artillery are. It's not always clear when you have the camera above your formation how the angles actually play out. Looks like their commander tried to leave and got shot, so that's a good start to the battle. Just as the fighting really begins, they're going to have that general lost or lord lost debuff. As for the plan, you've probably noticed I'm doing the classic checkerboard formation plan, where our front line are formed up in boxes with big gaps in between. The idea is that the AI is unlikely to navigate through those gaps, and they'll just stop in front of your boxes and fight there, and then the gaps will allow the gunners to shoot through, so we can constantly get some damage off of our ranged units while the armoured guys just keep the enemy in place. Looks like I've dumped my heavy thunderers, on the edge of the enemy's archer line, and that's going to do big damage, we've already killed one of their units, and we'll just keep plugging away. Even if it doesn't kill them, it's going to draw their fire and attention, and take the heat off our main formation, and as noted, those thunderers are disposable because they're going to be disposed of after this anyway, we might as well use them as bait. As for the enemy units that do come up to attack us here, We'll just do the thing to them, make sure they're standing here in front of our lines and shoot them, and the unoccupied legionaries that don't have anyone attacking them can turn to shoot as well. We actually need to advance here in this battle because the enemy have so many archers that just standing still won't be a good strategy, but for other cases I'm hoping I can just kind of stand there and wait for us to win. There's my faction leader by the way, not really helping. He is a ranged hero, and in my experience ranged heroes tend not to be very useful. So he probably shot a few people, but we can't really use him for very much. Looks like our sacrifice is going well, we've taken tons of damage on those heavy thunderers, but we've got plenty of enemies distracted. Meanwhile, their archer lines are completely exposed and we can just run down the hill towards them. Running at things isn't the expertise of the dwarves, so we're not really going to catch up to them, but we can just drive them away and generally stop them from attacking us. Our helicopter is going to do well, these poor medieval peasants well, what can they do when the melee helicopter comes in to chase you down? It doesn't do very much damage, but it's going to gradually kill them and keep them skirmishing away. So again, that will stop them damaging us. Broadly speaking, this battle will now be fine. We just gang up on the few remaining enemy units. These legionaries, by the way, while they have a ranged attack and are classified as a ranged unit, they actually suck as a ranged unit. Their attack has short range and very low damage. Their gimmick is that they have a shield breaker trait, which means when they shoot a unit with a shield, it doesn't get blocked like it normally does. I think there's a 50% chance of damage not being applied to shielded units from the front. But they're not very strong. You can see we just had one enemy soldier get shot twice in the back and just get up and keep jogging away. So yeah, not really got the strength there to take the enemy down and that's reflected in their kills after the battle. It was mainly the gunners behind them killing enemies. One thing to note, by the way, is that we're going to benefit immensely in this campaign from a nice bit of mechanical jank, the disconnect between health on the campaign map and health in battles. We basically didn't lose anything according to the campaign map there. And that's because battle health is the total hit points of a unit, whereas campaign health is how many troops are alive. And the more hit points individual models have and the fewer models there are in a unit, 
the greater the disconnect between those two things. And you get situations where you can fight a battle, it looks like a unit's half dead because its bar's gone down and it takes the morale hit for being half dead. But most of the models are all alive on low health, so on the campaign map it counts as not taking any damage. That's very useful and it's going to benefit us primarily because we have loads of small units in our roster. As you saw, we took the castle with an auto resolve. It wasn't actually that good of an auto resolve, we've taken some damage now. That's the downside to using an auto resolve. It's the opposite side of the coin of the thing I just mentioned. When you auto resolve, it doesn't use the thing where it's total hit points for damage and then troop count is a separate thing. It just reduces troop count as your damage instead. So we do take major damage in auto resolves even when they're more one sided. A little bit confusing, but by going for a build that maximizes casualty replenishment, which is always a good idea. We can hopefully get around that by getting to the usual point you can get to in Warhammer, where every one to two turns your army can completely regenerate and casualties don't matter so much. My next move is to attack this little island that's near the castle. There's another Bretonian faction here. Not much going on with them, so I thought we might as well just declare war on them real fast and get in there before they stir up any trouble. Balance bar looks okay for just going in for an attack, and it's not a walled settlement this time, so we could just get a normal field battle. But for whatever reason, I decided to let the siege carry on for a turn. And they did indeed sally against me. Maybe I was thinking it's just easier to pull off our standard strat on the defensive because moving our checkerboard formation forwards is a bit cumbersome. Well, anyway, here's another battle. The balance bar's gotten worse by the looks of things, despite it being the same fight for all intents and purposes. And of course, in the real fight, the balance bar will be getting much worse as more and more units come onto the field. The question remains, which is the real balance bar, the in-battle calculations or the on-campaign map calculations, and why are they different anyway? As the fight starts, their archers have spotted my helicopter floating over those cliffs. They can even take a few pot shots at it. It does actually have an exposed pilot, so in a purely in-universe sense, you probably could take down a gyrocopter by just shooting a few arrows at it. For now, we're going to hover up there because we'll need that thing later. In the meantime, we let the checkerboard do its thing as the enemy advance. But here we have what is probably the main weakness of this formation and approach, artillery. These boxes of troops are ripe for attack by area of effect weapons, and the fact they have loads of armor and are designed for holding up infantry won't do all that much when it comes to artillery shots which tend to have armor piercing damage. So those trebuchets are doing a little bit of a number on our block here. And as it stands, there's not much we can do about that, but this is where the gyrocopter will come in. Ordinarily, the enemy could just sit back and kill us, but we can send the gyrocopter to sneak down the edge of the map and dump our heavy thunderers right behind the trebuchets. Because everything else has rushed off to join the battle, there's not much here, so they can't really counter this move, and the heavy thunderers start thundering away. They have some kind of repeating gun, these heavy thunderers, which in practice just means they have a low reload time, it's certainly not fast enough to say it's a repeater. But they're faster shooting than normal thunderers, but they have a smaller unit size or something, I can't remember quite what the difference is. Here comes the real battle, they're charging in, in their hordes, these Bretonians, these disgusting humans, want some? Well, let's give it to them. By having our legionaries on guard mode, they can shoot their terrible guns even when they're in melee which is particularly useful when the melees are going to last a long time. We can get some extra damage with that. Also, because our dwarfs are kind of short, as you might have noticed, our gunners behind can shoot over the top of the legionaries and shoot things right in front of them in the melee as well, making the checkerboard formation approach particularly suitable to this army and this race. We do have some melee units, as you can see, the sentries, who aren't a very good melee unit, going in there to make an attack. Now we wait for the scouts to do their thing. It's a case where when you look at them, because this game doesn't have any animations for reloading or preparing to shoot, you can't tell if your guys are glitching out and just aren't doing anything, or whether they're technically reloading, there's just no animation for it. Inconvenient, really. Here's some of that shooting in the melee, all looking good. We are being pounded by the peasant bowmen once again, but with our armor, it won't do very much, and now there are plenty of enemy meat shields around us as well to force some friendly fire from that. Looks like the Thunderers have done their job. A few bowmen are distracted by them. Going in for a melee there, probably a bad move. The Thunderers have armor, so they've got stats enough to resist those peasants. 
the gyrocopters keeping itself busy, killing the enemy's commander, that wizard could be a problem. Luckily the gyrocopter has this anti-infantry cannon, it does bonus damage to small targets and has a bit of area of effect damage as well, so that's doing the business. Now I wanted to see if our faction leader Oldo here is actually doing anything, it looks like he's not, I think this is a case where he is glitching out and not shooting. The way far it will works is mysterious. It doesn't necessarily shoot when you can shoot, sometimes it wants to shoot something that it can't, decides that it can't and does nothing instead. About a minute later we do catch him shooting the enemy, but by this point the enemy have withdrawn. This is another upside to this plan. If the enemy rout, while they're likely to come back, they're getting shot while they're moving away, getting shot while they come back, meaning it's unlikely that units will do well with a rout and come back style strategy, which many units can do in this game. So while we've still got some work to do in this battle, looks like we're going to be pulling off a win. Some of our units are heavily damaged, but not quite so damaged when it comes to troop number. They just look heavily damaged because it's showing the total hit points, and that will come in useful in a second again. Soon everything is routing, and now we see one of the main downsides of our army. In this game, anything you don't kill on the battlefield will still be alive on the campaign map. You can't just end the battle once the enemy start withdrawing and then it kills a few of the enemy for you. Like in some Total Wars, this is one of the ones where you have to do it the hard way, but we can't, we're too slow, we don't really have the ability to chase down the enemy. So anything that routes actually has a pretty decent chance of surviving and we ended up only killing like half of the enemy force in the end when we probably could have killed them all if we had some unit that was like cavalry or something like that. Well, we don't, but at least we won. We're going to have to face them again immediately after as we now push in to make the siege attack. But that balance bar looks good. And as you might note on the left, our army is less dead than it looked like it was in the battle thanks to the thing I was talking about. We do the auto resolve, that was all fine. And boom, we've taken another territory. This faction does have another territory to the southwest, so it's not the end of that yet. And some survivors from the battle are still out there. They're actually just going to make a suicide attack in their turn, just to make it easy for us. I always like it when the AI does this, because it's really annoying to waste time walking off to kill negligible forces. It's inefficient, I guess. But when they kill themselves, well, we can just not worry about them and do something more productive with our time once it's our turn. I'm releasing the captives here, although hesitantly, because you do get that minus 10% campaign movement range when you release captives for a couple of turns. And I do like me some campaign movement range, but I also like me the money you get from releasing them. Now here's a bit of a decision that comes from the Steel Faith Overhaul mod, the Beastmen Rising thing. You have to say yes, no to a do you want to be killed by the Beastmen question in effect. It doesn't actually say that, but in my experience, that's what it's saying. And I had a vague memory of playing a campaign with the Beastmen enabled before and thinking it was really annoying. So no is probably the right answer. But you might have seen I clicked on yes, that was because I was feeling lucky I suppose, I just thought well let's see what happens. This is a very let's see what happens campaign because this is a modded faction. I didn't know if it would be impossible to win or too easy to win, it could go either way. So I just thought let's throw in the beast men to spruce things up and they certainly will be sprucing things up as we'll see. The place I need to attack to the southwest is pretty exposed however. The main force of that faction, it's actually the Jean d'Arc faction, the Jean d'Arc ripoff faction that I forget the name of, has gone to the southeast, and we can tell that because we saw them rebuilding a territory. That means we want to go there first and take out their main army before we go after their territory, otherwise that main army will attack our home territory. On the way we're going to wait a couple of turns to get a bunch more units. We've got loads of money now after capturing that territory to the north, so might as well do that. And we can even afford to throw out another army, so I thought I'll make a small force to hang out in our home territory and build up a few units there, just in case we need it, or I think of something useful to do with it. We can see a few hints here of better units that will be available. We've got a grenades version of the legionaries, and there's a blunderbuss version as well, not quite sure what they'll be good for, but we might try them out at some point. That's where I shall end this first part of this abridged campaign. I will mention again that I do intend to make some narrative videos based on this campaign, so I'm going to write the story of Oldor Greybeard here. The first part's probably just going to be like a prologue where it tells the story of how this situation of him being in the desert came about. I don't even know how much of this first part will end up being included in the narrative first part. 
Well, we'll see, I don't really know what I'm doing, but if you want to find out what I'm doing, the first video might even already be out, for all I know, on the Game World Narratives channel, my other channel, which is linked in the description, most likely at least. I'm very good at being a YouTuber, I assure you. Aside from all that, on this channel right here, part 2 of this abridged campaign will be coming soon, so I'll catch you for that.